Hey everyone, so I wanna share a little something with you today. Very important about this particular episode. I believe there is no such thing as perfection. In an attempt to fight and combat my recovering perfectionist inside of me, I had a failure in this video. I was recording this video and about five minutes into it, I noticed that it stopped recording video. Instead of saying it has to be perfect, I'm just gonna show you the video anyways. I'm gonna show you the video for the first five minutes and the rest is just gonna be audio with a black screen or something. I hope that you can understand and hopefully get some content out of it instead of focusing on the perfection of everything because I believe that far too many of us let perfectionism get in the way. It's the fear, it's like, oh, what are they gonna think of me? So you know what, I'm just releasing the video. I don't care. I had, a, I had a technical issue, but I do believe in what I did share. So I'm gonna let you have the episode and let it be what it is because there's no such thing as perfection. And that is a very big thing to understand in this industry and to not let fear of what, of what other people think of you get in the way. So I hope you enjoy this video despite the uh, lack of video at a certain point and let me know if you've found it helpful. So, on to the video. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Mastering Post-Production Sound. My name is Joel. I am a sound re-recording mixer, been part of the post-production sound industry for the past 16 years, and I'm here to help you navigate the murky waters of the post-production sound industry. Today, I am sharing my origin story. This is really how I started, what it was like for me, and where I am today. A lot of people have asked me online, like, hey, how was it for you? How did you first start? Well, this is my opportunity to share where I came from, a little bit of my background, and what it's been like for me. I absolutely love what I do. And people often ask me, hey, how did it start for you? I, When people ask me that, I say, this kind of just fell in my lap. It wasn't anything that I planned to really do. When I was in high school, I was a band geek. I was a band nerd. I loved uh, jazz and I loved being part of the marching band. I played the saxophone, woodwind, and I always thought music would be a part of my life. I grew up listening to my father's records, um, Benny Goodman, Duke Ellington records, and he was a saxophone player and I said, I gotta be part of it. So I carried that love into high school and ultimately into, into college. And I just thought I was going to be a jazzer. You know, I was just going to play jazz and become a session player. And I went to a community college, small community college here in Southern California, and really had a really strong music program. But we got a lot of exposure because a lot of the, the teachers there had connections with real professional musicians. And so what they would do is they would bring these musicians in to talk, talk to us about life, about what it was working as a musician, what it took, the dedication. And with all the hands-on experience, being in the recording sessions, sight reading, going on gigs, traveling summers in Hawaii, you know, uh, traveling to Japan, doing tours, doing gigs, we learned a lot about being a musician and what it takes. I am telling you, in those college days, I spent so many hours practicing. You know, I told you I was a saxophone player, but I had to learn how to play the clarinet, the flute, the oboe. I had to do it all. And so the only way I could learn those things was by spending a lot of time to learn those crafts and to learn those new instruments. It was drained into our brain. Like, you must practice, practice, practice. And not just, oh, some of the lines that were hard, some of the pieces of music, but... I'm talking about, you know, long tones, sitting there with a tuner to try to get my pitch and work on it and, and to work on my intonation. All this stuff that you do behind the door so that when you actually go out to perform, you actually did well. You practiced so that you, when you would perform, it would be second nature. So I was, drain, I was trained and drilled in my brain that you just, you, you got to get it right. When that red light goes on in the recording, studio, it's game on. Like you get one, one th run through and then that's it. So a lot of my training, musical training, um, really set the foundation for my career now in post-production sound. Little did I know back then. But fast forward, I transferred, was still doing music and jazz. I got my first laptop. I got my first 
Apple MacBook G4 and it came with Logic and I had never used a DAW in my life. And it was this software that changed everything for me. I was like, what? I could actually have ideas, musical ideas, and put them down here and use these MIDI instruments and I can record myself playing. I remember recording some flute lines and, oh, what's reverb? Let me try this. Oh, I was in heaven. I was like, this is so cool. So I spent hours and hours and hours just learning the the DAW, learning logic and, and what I could do and, and, and how I can mix and manipulate these sounds of these recordings. And at the time, I was really getting into music composition. I, I loved writing songs. And, and I said, hey, you know, scoring, that would be, I love music. Why not try that? And so this newfound relationship with technology, because I had never had it, it piqued this this whole new interest. And so as I practiced and experimented with composing, I quickly started getting ideas out and I didn't want to spend money to pay somebody to mix these scores that I was coming up with because I started getting out there. I started answering ads for short films on Craigslist, you know, and anything online I could get, I started doing these things. And I thought, well, I got to step it up. I took like one recording class. I took one recording, like 101 audio engineering, and they taught you a little bit about Pro Tools. But I said, I'm going to learn. It was already in me from being a musician, all the hours of practicing, practicing, practicing. So I said, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn how to edit the audio, I'm gonna learn how to mix the audio, use the EQ, use the reverb. If I had questions, I'd ask questions or I would look it up. And so I I just went all in. I went all in on learning. And it was this curiosity that fueled the learning. And so fast forward, I was doing a lot of you know free gigs, low, no pay gigs for music composing, all the while still doing my music and, and gigging and students and things like that. And a director friend of mine said, hey, Joel, I need some sound design for my short film. Can you do that? And I was like, he knew I was, I was a composer. But I was like, sound design? It was literally the first time I'd ever heard the term sound design. He's like, yeah, you know, some thunder and lightning and some tones and different kind of sound effects. Oh, yeah, sound design. Yeah, yeah, I could do that. I did not know how to do it, I, I swear. But I said, well, it can't be much different than composing, right? I'm just going to use sounds, layer sounds, different things. Yeah, let's do it. So I did it. And I had a lot of fun doing it. I had a lot of fun doing it. And it was the beginning. I caught the bug. I caught the sound bug. And I thought, this is so cool. So I experimented. I learned. I took sounds and I did his short film. And then that led to wanting to do more. And I went out there and I started to basically – advertise myself as a one-stop shop. I would do score and sound design. And that's what I did. I reached out online. I reached out. I answered. You know, I went, at the time, Mandy.com was a thing. I don't think it is anymore. But you can go on to these forums and you can look for jobs. Sound designer needed. You know, sound mixer needed. Composer needed. And I would just say, hey, you know, I've done a couple things. This is my musical background. Here's my resume. I would love an opportunity to collaborate or to even, you know, you can check out my work and give me a shot. And I did it. And I had people reject me. Um, I, I sent stuff and they didn't like it. But then I sent stuff and people would like it. And they would say, hey, yeah, you could do this. So I learned and I continued to get gig after gig after gig, just learning, always learning. Well, I remember at one point I continued to do the, the music composition, even to the point of getting music landing on shows like uh, Home Extreme Makeover. Um, at the time, there was a series called The Untold, Untold Stories of the ER on the Learning Channel. So I had an opportunity and I started getting my music out there. But I really loved the sound thing. And so I at one point said, wow, I'm going to have to maybe choose where I focus my attention. Is it going to be all in on the music, the co music composition, or sound? And through a series of, of events, people I knew, somebody I knew at, at the church I was going to, he was a director, he said, hey, I know a mixer. If you'd like to talk to him, why don't you go, you know, you know, connect with him? I said, thank you, emailed him, you know, and this is at 
at the time, I didn't know who he was, but he was so nice. And he said, yeah, sure, come on over to my house, invited me to his house. And I just got an opportunity to meet him, tell him my story, tell him what I was into. You know, I did music. I also wanted to do sound design. And I remember, I'll never forget, he, he was like, well, you're going to make a lot more money working in music. Why do you want to work in sound, kid? Stay out of sound. Stick with music. You make more money. And I'll never forget that. But he was such a sweet guy. And I kid you not, many, many years later, many years later, I was nominated for an Emmy. And there was a, a Dolby Emmy party that we went to for all the nominees. And I saw that same individual there. And I went up to him and was like, hey, you remember me? You, I went to your house and, and you told me, stay stay out of sound, kid. You know, stick with music. And he said, oh, my God, I'm so glad you didn't listen to me. And he was nominated that year, too. And it was just a fun moment. But somebody gave me time. Somebody gave me time to hear me. Then that led to other people saying, hey, you know, I'll, I'll talk to you. And I'll never forget because... I wanted to get into post sound at another level, not just you know what I was doing with these small short films. And I went back, I said, who do I know? And, and it was my old uh, community college and someone said, hey, go talk to this adjunct professor, he may know. And I went and he said, oh yeah, you're the one who wants to get to post sound. Well, here, uh, Here's a here's a magazine. He literally gave me like I think a mixed magazine, and in the back of the magazine there was a list of all the studios and all their email and content information. I kid you not. I went and I I emailed must have emailed like thirty people, and I heard back from nobody. I got rejected, and it was just I felt like is this real? Like nobody is responding to me. Then it happened. Then I got one email response. And the email went something like this. Hey, Joel, I get a lot of emails every day from people wanting jobs or inquiring about the company. But something about your letter stood out. I would like to meet you. I don't have a job for you, but I would like to meet you. I went berserk. I was like, yes, yes, I cannot believe it. And at the time, it was the old Sound Deluxe. Those of you who, in post-production sound who know, old Sound Deluxe. And I went and she took me around, introduced me to people, um, really prominent sound designers. And then we just sat and we talked. And I shared a little bit of my story, my background, you know, by this time I was obviously out of school and everything. Um, I was married. And um, she said, Joel, this industry is very difficult to get into. It's kind of like a circle. In that circle, everybody wants to get into that circle, but not a lot of people do. But when you get your foot in the door, you are in. When you get your foot in that circle, you're in. And remember that. When you're in, you're in. And your reputation is everything. People will know of you because of your reputation. People in this industry are not liked because of their reputation, and it goes around. And she's, she gave me some of the best advice. And this works for me. This worked for me. This is the path I took. It may work for you. It may not. But she said, Joel, go get a, go get a job, an entry-level job at a small mom-and-pop post-production facility. And remember, when you get hired, the minute you walk through those doors, you are getting paid to learn. <laughs> Blew my mind. And you know what? I remember reaching out to several several places, and then I got one response. Oh, we don't have any jobs yet, but you know, you know, send you know, thank you for your resume. Uh, we'll be in touch, you know. And or yeah, keep checking in. Checked in, and I remember it was close to around. Uh, you know, uh, this time the tape at the time of this filming. You know, we're in December, and I remember Thanksgiving. I sent an email. How you doing, Mister So and So? Just want to check in. Want to wish you, you know, happy Thanksgiving. Hope all's well. Then I follow up again in December. Hey, M Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. You know, hope hope ever you have a wonderful holiday season. Just wanted to check in. Um, hope you have a great time. And he said, you know what, Joel? Actually, we just got a new vault manager. And we may be needing some people. Like, would you be available, like, the new year or something to come in for a, um, an interview? What? Are you serious? I could not believe it. He's like, yeah, I'd like you to meet, you know, the new vault manager. And that was it. That was the beginning. And I remember driving up 
the Hollywood freeway and seeing the Hollywood sign up in, you know, up in the hills there and just filled with just like anxiety and fear and excitement. Just remember just pray to be like, oh, God, it'd be so great to work in Hollywood. Just please let me this happen. And I remember driving, going there, having the interview, feeling good about it, but not knowing. And I got the job. I got the job. You know, it was like it was not too long after I got the job. And I was like, yes. And and it was for me the beginning. I remember I worked in a tape vault. I got hired to drive a truck to go pick up film, to drive all over Hollywood, you know, to to take the 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 HD cam SRs, the D5, the beta cam, you know, and give them to the editors and 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 keep it all you know straight when they needed you know an old tape from an old episode of CSI or something I don't know you know everything um, I would go get it you know but I started creating relationships with the people that worked there I started telling them who I was what I wanted to do and the fact that I had direction there were a lot of people in that vault and let me tell you they were just kind of they were just getting by okay but I had purpose I knew pay attention because she told me pay attention remember you're getting paid to learn. And so right away, I made connections with one of the engineers there in in the sound facility. And he said, hey, stick with me. You know, I'll teach you everything. We just happened to be be um, both musicians. He, you know, he had went to, gosh, I, want, I, think, I, want, I think he went to Juilliard or something like that. Uh, he was a trumpet player and just a, a, a doll, one of my first early mentors. And he just took me under his wing and we learned and he taught me <laughs> at the time there was a fair light there. Um, but there was a Pro Tools too and taught me all these things and I gained trust. I gained trust day in, day out. I went and I trained. They had an opportunity to train in, in any department you want if you you met your probational hours. And uh, I made sure to, to be on time, to have a good attitude. And so when I got my opportunity to go train, cross train with audio, I built trust right away. I built trust, and that led to my first kind of audio job there. We had this um, Rick D's Weekly Top 40. Uh, Those of you who know that in the States back in the 80s, we had quarter-inch Nagra tape, and they wanted to digitize their whole entire album. And so I, they said, hey, that kid Joel, he can do it. Uh, Yeah, I can do it. And so I remember spending time uh, learning the quarter inch Nagra, setting it up, digitizing it to Pro Tools, and then falling in love with the 80s, 1984 and 85, top 40. It was awesome. But I built trust with these people, and I showed them that, one, I had a good attitude, and two, I was there when I said I would be there, and I got the job done. Well, that then parlayed into an opportunity. I was in within 12 to 15 months. Uh, I got out of the vault, sister company, which was a sound house in Hollywood and became a recordist. They needed a recordist. Somebody was moving up, someone to come in. I didn't know what to do as a recordist. I didn't know what the, all I knew was like, I knew audio. I was still this whole entire time doing short films, learning, spending time working on stuff. I was bringing my student projects in, my low budget things there that I built trust. So when the opportunity came, I got to go interview for that, and they hired me. And that's where everything began, where I really took the deep dive into be, becoming a, a, a mix tech, a recordist, learning. You know, my main job was to support the mixers. So I had to learn. Each mixer was different. Each mixer had a template. They liked things loaded in a certain way. They wanted to make sure when they came into the stage, I had tuned all the speakers. I SPL'd the whole room so everything sounded great and right. And quickly, I started building trust with those mixers. And because you never know who you're going to be working with in this industry or who you're going to meet, I got the opportunity to meet people. There were people working, you know, who were four-walling the room from Sony, um, other places in, in Burbank. And because of those relationships, that mix tech job ended up becoming an opportunity for me to mix my first one of my first series there. Then, uh, funny, interesting enough, they fired a composer and I got hired as a composer as well. So I was composing and mixing and sound designing, sound supervising the show. It was really fun. But the relationships with the mixers, that was a big thing. They said, this guy, he gets it, he understands. I tried to show up for those people all the time. I showed up for them. I worked hard. I learned. I had a notebook. I made mistakes. I, I remembered and I wrote it down. Or I didn't know anything. I would write that down. Oh, how do I do that? Okay, I got to write that down. I got to remember that. They like it like this or this happens like this. I got notes, notes. Always carry a notepad, especially if you're a mix tech when you're learning. But they remembered. And one of the lead mixers, when there was an opportunity at this at the sound facility, 
to hire somebody, they said, hey, we have to hire Joel. And I was fortunate enough to become, I think at the time, one of the youngest mixers on staff. Um, but that's that's how it started for me. And I got my opportunity, you know, and then I was teamed up with a partner because at the time I don't have a lot of credits. And so you're like, how do you get credits? Well, you need credits to get credits is this catch 22. And so fortunately, because I had done a, a great job at creating relationships and just building trust amongst the people I supported and I served in the industry, I was able to then be vouched for. And they said, hey, look, we, we want to team you up with somebody who had credits. We got our first TV show together. It was a show on the ABC or uh, and then on ABC Family called The Lion Game. And I I was fortunate enough to to work with um with that individual for five years and it was great. And so that started my journey. You know, that's how I started in the industry. And along the way, I've been so fortunate to meet people and to grow in my craft. It's not an overnight success, but when you look at it like, wow, how did you get there from there? You know? And I say, well, really a day at a time. I really just put the time in each and every day, a little and a little and a little. Like this journey continues for me. And now at a place where I've been able to do some really awesome things and a really awesome um, opportunities as far as now also doing feature films, but, and working with my partner now, who's a four-time Oscar nominee, that, that's a masterclass in itself, just learning every single day as I mix alongside him. But always having the right attitude, being prepared for any opportunity. I believe that luck is really being at the intersection of preparation and opportunity. So along the way, I've been fortunate to learn a lot of things and make mistakes, but really not mistakes. They're all learning lessons, you know? And so that's a little bit of the history of like kind of how I, you know, got started, you know, how I progressed. I know I kind of, you know, there's, it's so much. It's like, how do you get 16 years into one episode? But I did it all, you know. I, I I cut sound effects. I did sound design. I, I scored music. I become a mix tech, you know. Um, then finally became uh, uh, a a Y one mixer with the union. Got into the union, and you know the rest is history. Been able to really be, oh gosh, just a small part in a big picture. And I have so much gratitude for everybody who's helped me along the way. I'm still just living my dreams out. And I still have goals just to keep doing more bigger things. Part of part of it is sharing here. Here sharing the knowledge, the experience that I have. Because growing up in the industry, I didn't have anybody. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're starting your journey in post-production sound. You just do not know which way to go. If you're new here, I just want to let you know I have a free gift for you. If you go to masteringpostproductionsound.com slash insider's guide, I want to give you my free guide. It's the insider's guide to navigating the post-production sound industry. It's the five core principles that I believe every post-production sound professional should master. That's absolutely yours for free. So please go do, do it. Grab it. All you have to do is enter your email and it's yours in your email box. But this journey is not over for me. And I'm excited because every day I get to learn more and more and more. If you have any questions about my path feel free to leave it in the comments below. But that's going to wrap it up for this episode of Mastering Post-Production Sound. I thank you for being here, for being on this journey for me, because this is a new journey for me too. But I want you to know you're not alone. You do not have to do life alone. We're not, I believe, we're not meant to do life alone. And that also includes not doing this industry alone. So if you're new here, make sure you've, you're subscribed to the channel. And thank you so much. I'll see you in next week's episode.